unit continues unabated throughout Western society. From a biblical perspective, marriage is intended to be lifelong, but that perspective began to change about 30 years ago, and divorce has become almost commonplace. For good or for bad, divorce is a reality in today's world. In the United States, divorces in families with children under 18 top one million every year. While attention is often focused on the adults in divorce proceedings, the impact on the next generation can be devastating. On this week's program, Children of Divorce, we'll hear from experts in the field of family counseling, as well as those who've experienced their parents' divorce. We'll hear about the effects on children of different ages and either sex. We'll show you how you can help your children if divorce is inevitable. We'll also hear how single parents can minimize the impact of divorce, and we'll find out what parents in general should avoid to keep marriage, love, and the family alive. We begin with the effects of divorce on young people. A lot of times, I don't have motivation a lot of times to do things for myself, because I only did things for my father, and then once he left, I just thought, well, there's no use anymore. I have five brothers and two sisters. And we all have major scars from it. When we were little, when we were growing up during the divorce and that sort of thing, we couldn't talk about it to each other. We fought a lot um, because that's what we saw our parents do. I'm thinking back to our house. We owned a home, and I was told when I was younger that we'd, we'd be living there for years. We'd never sell it. And then when the divorce came through later on, the house had to be sold. You know, the family split up, the house was sold, the parents went their way, and the promise was broken. And so, and I was away at the time, which made it even more difficult because I never returned home, never returned to that house again. I didn't really feel angry. I felt more sad because we stayed with my father, and it was just, it was really sad to not have my mom around, and to see my mom every other weekend was one of the hardest things, I think, in my life that happened at the time. My parents got divorced when I was six years old, and at first I felt sad because my daddy wasn't with us anymore, and then after that I felt alone. I felt alone. There's no question that children of divorce suffer at the time of the breakup and for years after. Some never get over the effects. I asked Dr. Jean Grossman why divorce is so devastating to a child. Because it's like death. It's the death of the family. It's the death of the intact family. And, and as we are devastated by the, the loss of a loved one through death, so we're devastated by the loss of a loved one through divorce. It also is the end of a dream, a dream of, of happiness, a dream of, 
sake of mutual satisfaction. So there's a lot of fantasy that goes into it. That terrible sense of loss was well described by one of the victims of divorce we interviewed. It is like a death in the family. You find that you, when you go to bed at night, there's only one parent you kiss goodnight. Um, there's only one parent there at the dinner table. There's only one parent there when the report card comes home from school. Uh, when you cry, there's only one parent there that you can put your shoulders on. Uh, it's, it's like everything's been cut in two. It's like, it really is like some, what somebody has died in the family. It's just as stressful. A child who's known no other basis for existence than his or her parents can be very disturbed by divorce. Children are dependent beings. They need comfort, reassurance, and security. They need a positive, encouraging environment to thrive. When parents divorce, that security is pulled away, and children are often the last to know why the separation is happening. Worse still, depending on their age, they're more or less incapable of understanding the disruption in their lives, and that can produce guilt. I didn't know why he left, but I thought that if I, he had very high expectations of me, and I thought if I had been more what he wanted me to be, then he would have probably stayed. I thought maybe he just gave up on me when he found out that I wasn't what he was hoping I would be. I asked Dr. Patricia Edmister of the California Family Study Center to explain further how divorce changes children's behavior. In many cases they're very angry and, and they don't really have a, a direction for their anger often. They don't know whether to be angry at mommy or at daddy or at society or at themselves, but they're feeling tremendous anger because things are happening in their world that they can't control. Different children react differently in divorce situations. It depends on age, sex, and economic circumstances. But probably most important is how well divorcing parents prepare their children for the event. Dr. Irene Goldenberg is a family counselor at the University of California, Los Angeles. They feel, and rightly so, that their world has been torn apart, and they're very confused and upset. But again, if a mother will come in and say, it will come back together, I will be okay, your father will be okay, we both have a relationship to you and we're not going to desert you, then children have, again, an enormous resiliency. Another professional we talk to in this field is Dr. Hugh McIsaac. He's very much involved in mediating family disputes before a court trial becomes necessary. I asked him if there was a difference between boys and girls in reaction to divorce. Boys have more trouble with the solution, uh, that is, in the beginning. And part of it, I think, is because in many situations, fathers just drop out. Uh, we know that in 70% of the cases, after five years, fathers uh, don't even support, much less see their ch child. That's a tragic loss to a child. And while it's becoming a little more common for fathers to have custody of their children after divorce, most of these children do not have meaningful access to their fathers. Patty was eight or nine when her parents divorced. She still thinks about her dad at certain times. It would be neat to have a dad, like at graduation, when I graduated. It would have been really neat to have my dad there to show him that I've graduated, to show him my accomplishments. That's when I really miss him, is when I've done something, I want to show him my achievements, and he's not there. The young man we're about to see again has gone through two divorces, once as a young child and once as a teenager. I asked him what the greatest impact of the broken home has been. In my case, the loss of a father figure. The first time my father left and then the second time around I had a stronger mother than a father. So all my life I've seen a strong woman, a dominant woman, and no, no male leadership. So it leaves you wondering, how do I act? What do I do? How can I take charge? But whether it's father or mother who has custody, children of divorce still hurt. And they express their frustration in various ways. Divorce seems harder on young children, say age three to five, because they can't easily understand what's happening to their world. Teenagers may cope a little better, because they've often developed a support system beyond the immediate family. They're beginning to think their own thoughts and decide where they're going in life. But does that mean there's a best age for divorce in a child's life? 
there's never really a good age. We're finding that the youngsters 9 to 12, 9 to 13, seem the most able to understand what is happening, the least likely to take ownership for the kinds of problems that are going on. Government studies show that over 50% of children in the United States will experience a first divorce. And of those who become part of a new family through remarriage, 37% will experience a second divorce. The chances of children of divorce carrying the scars into their own marriages is very great, and through no fault of their own. What's happened in society that failed families have become so commonplace? One thing I see a lot of in counseling today is, is a lot of selfishness. Very ego-centered adults. Whereas 10 or 15 years ago, I found people, even when they were engaged in conflict uh, in a relationship or in their marriage, they still were invested to a greater degree in the other person. Today, I see people very invested in themselves. The kinds of conflict that they get into in many cases are, are I want, and I don't really care anymore what you want, I want. And that's the message, or that is a message, that we're really giving to our children. Consequently, in 10 or 15 years, I'm going to see more, I think, I want, because that's the message that's being conveyed. And what I want, I get. Is that the way to ensure a happy marriage? Isn't marriage supposed to be about shared responsibilities? A healthy relationship demands mutual respect. Selfishness really has no part in marriage and the family. One of the one of the, the bases of this problem may be the fact that we've become so narcissistic, so self-oriented in our in our thinking and our approach to life, as um, we've been uh, exploited by the kind of marketing and advertising that says self-fulfillment comes through um, having more, more more kinds of self-aggrandizement rather than uh, a, a group a sense of group, a sense of purpose among people, a sense of affiliation and connection with people. And I think the seeds of our destruction are there. That is, if we don't change that individual, individualistic orientation to something that focuses on the group, that's where we will, we will um, self-destruct. We need, we need each other, and divorce raises that issue. Divorce does indeed raise that issue. We do need each other, and we need whole families. So we're pleased to be able to offer this free booklet, How to Have a Happy Marriage. If you want to strengthen your marriage or avoid divorce, then you may need this free booklet. This chapter shows that marriage is more than a physical relationship. There's a vital mental and spiritual side to marriage that's too often overlooked. When it is, then as this next chapter shows, the kissing begins to stop. Even the physical side of marriage starts to break down. But there are things that can be done. Here's an important chapter about sex in marriage, and another that shows how to improve and heal damaged relationships between husbands and wives. Another one about one of marriage's most common problems, money. And there's much more. This booklet, How to Have a Happy Marriage, is yours free for the asking, without any cost or obligation. Along with it, if you're not already a subscriber, you'll receive this helpful free magazine, The Plain Truth. The Plain Truth examines the many social issues facing us today, from marriage and the family, to the environment, to the drug dilemma. Here's a recent article on runaways, where they come from, and why they're leaving home. Here's another on the space race, where it's leading us, and this one on human suffering. If God exists, why does he allow misery, crime, and war? And there's much more in every issue. The Plain Truth will help you understand this world in a way you probably never have before. And it's yours, free for the asking. No cost, no one will call on you, and you won't be billed later. I'll be offering this literature again at the end of the program. Now back to our subject, children of divorce. As we're seeing today, the price of divorce is extremely high. But are there things we can do to lessen the devastating effects of divorce on our children? I asked doctors Edmister and Goldenberg for one major recommendation they'd make to divorcing parents. I would tell them try to be as warm and supportive of the children as possible, to try to continue to show their care and their love for the children 
and to keep their fighting separate and away from the children as much as possible. The most important thing is not to fight through the child. And of course that is the probably biggest thing I see that people come in with and the easiest thing to do. When two people are in great disagreement with one another, great stress, and they cannot m resolve it, they will pull in a third person. And usually the third person around is some innocent child or some child who volunteers in a mistaken idea that they're going to help them work it out. And when that happens, that triangulation, it's devastating for everybody involved. It truly doesn't solve the problem and it entangles the child. One young woman we talked with had exactly that experience. I think that what affected me um, mainly is I was caught between my parents' bitterness and arguments. Um, for example, if I would be visiting my mom, my dad would drill me first in telling me what to say, why not to divulge, any family secrets I'm not supposed to say. And then when I would get to my mom, she would um, try to get these secrets out of me. And then she would ask me what to say, and she would drill me what to say, not to say going back. And of course, in all this confusion, I'm, I'm sure I made mistakes. And when I would get back to my dad's, I would get in trouble. And um, just being caught between their, their arguments and, and their problems, I think that gave me a lot of insecurity and uh, low confidence that I've always struggled with. Uh, I look at people that have they come from whole families and they don't have to struggle against that. They have an inner confidence. For me, it's taken a lot of years to just gain some confidence. I just wish I didn't have to go through that. As you can see, these early experiences of parental conflict can have long-term consequences. The concept of not fighting over the child is very important. Equally important is that children not become an emotional crutch. But one of the things that's very important is that the child doesn't end up being the parent while the parent ends up being the child. That the youngster doesn't have to assume the responsibility of taking care of the emotional needs of the adult. And that some attention is paid to the emotional needs of the child. Now that seems very obvious, but it's not so easy at the time and it's something parents have to remind themselves of. There are other ways to help children caught in the divorce trap. Parents can do a great deal to soften the blow. And if they will, then children can get through divorce. I think the cooperation of parents, I think, is the critical factor. That parents work together and, 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 and uh, communicate. Uh, and that the divorce is in the spousal role, not in the parental role. That as long as you have children, you're parents forever. Uh, that you will, there will be weddings, there'll be, uh, you know, high school, graduations, uh, all of the things that we celebrate about our children that these parents can, co can work and participate in and enjoy. According to the Bible, children are the gift of God. How tragic then to see them systematically destroyed by parents who don't love and encourage, or couples who are selfishly breaking apart with little or no thought for the impact on fragile young lives. What else can be done to help? The main thing I think uh, that we can do as educators and, and therapists and, uh, is to acknowledge that these children are in pain and that they're suffering. To begin to say, you must be hurting. This must be a painful experience for you. We understand that you're undergoing stress and that you're in a difficult time. Even if children are not ready to open up and come forth and say, thank you, uh, appreciate your acknowledgement, it means a great deal to them that you're sensitive and you're acknowledging that they are in pain because by doing that you acknowledge their existence. When these children, one of the damaging and devastating uh, elements in these things is they don't feel like they exist. They don't feel that their pain is acknowledged. There's no one saying it must hurt. And to the extent that we're able to do that and to, and to do that sensitively, we will help each other and the children through divorcing situations. I asked Jody what helped her through the roughest part of her divorce experience. I think my grandfather did. I, at the time, I wasn't really close enough to anybody to really talk about it. Um, I remember it was the first time I ever prayed in my life was that night that it happened because I just, 
I just went up to my room and I said, oh, what's happening? I, it was the first time I ever prayed because it was the only person I could think of that knew what was going on that I could talk to, even though I hadn't before. But um, it was the first time I ever really talked to my grandfather, too, because I felt like I needed to talk to somebody. Didn't really have that kind of relationship with anybody, so I just kind of opened up to him just to see how it would work out. And he really helped me a lot. Beyond the immediate family and the professionals, others can be of great help too. Society, it seems, must return to a true sense of family, a true sense of community. The larger extended family and the community as a whole should function as a buffer against the ravages of divorce. We all have a responsibility to help our fellow human beings. The familiar words of Christ, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, couldn't be more appropriate. When a person gets help from the broader community, it can be of great benefit. If we were struggling with divorce in young children, wouldn't we want someone to stop and lend a hand? Raising children after divorce is very difficult. It takes time to adjust. In fact, it generally takes two or three years to come to a point of equilibrium. Quick remarriage is probably not the answer to the single divorced parent's problems, and it can cause its own problems for the child of divorce. My father actually was remarried even before my mom got the divorce papers, and I think that was, that was very difficult to deal with. Um, I think the hardest part is knowing that mom is alone and dad has somebody because I worry about mom because she's on her own. I, I worry about there's no one there for her to come home to. There's no one there to look after her as she grows older. It's obvious too that the divorced single parent faces particular problems. But again, it's not hopeless. There are ways of lessening the burden of parenting alone. And I think that one of the things that a person should do if they're raising a child alone is to develop a support system. And that support system should be other people who they rely on, or another person, or other people that they rely on, to give them the kind of feedback you need when you're raising children. No matter who you are, you're not smart enough to do it entirely alone. That can be the church, that can be family members, that can be other adult people. This week, we've taken a quick overview of some of the dimensions of the divorce problem. There's no question that a happy married relationship with loving children who are loved in return is one of the most satisfying human experiences. We conclude with some evidence that happy marriage can be achieved by children of divorce, despite the odds. Well, I... I get a lot of strength from God. I have to really pray about this. And uh, then I have to remember that being married, my husband is always giving me strength too, and he believes in me. So that's been, I think, the, the biggest help in my life. And then having our family whole, I see that, uh, that you can be healed. It just takes a long time. Children of divorce are perhaps the most eloquent advocates of stable marriage. They know the consequences of broken homes. Marriage is, in fact, a divine institution, something God himself gave to man, according to the Bible record. It's something to be carefully planned, faithfully adhered to, and continually cared for. With that kind of commitment, marriage can be lifelong, and children need not suffer the anguish of divorce. If you're contemplating divorce, please think again. If you have children, doubly think again and analyze why divorce seems the only way out. Maybe it is the only way, and maybe it's not. If you could use more help in thinking things through, this free booklet, How to Have a Happy Marriage, and the Plain Truth magazine have been very helpful to many. How to Have a Happy Marriage is a biblical look at the institution and values of marriage. The first chapter shows how it's possible to have a happy marriage in an unhappy world. Here's a chapter with advice for the time when the kissing begins to stop. This chapter shows what to do when marriage starts to go sour. There are steps to take before divorce becomes an inevitability. And a section on family finances, one of the most common marriage problems. When children are being planned, there's important preparation to be made, as this chapter shows. And here's one with helpful insight on what to do if you're frustrated 
because your mate isn't fulfilling his or her family responsibilities. Is divorce the only solution? As I say, this free booklet, How to Have a Happy Marriage, has helped many, and it's yours free for the asking. Along with it, if you're not already a subscriber, we'll be sending you a free subscription to The Plain Truth magazine for as long as you'd like. The Plain Truth is a magazine of understanding. Its understanding covers world news, social conditions, the whys and wherefores of our time. Without a biblical grasp of world events and social conditions, it's going to be very difficult to cope with the tremendous rate of change in the next few years. Upcoming issues will feature articles on Europe, as well as trends captured firsthand by our correspondents around the world. The Plain Truth doesn't forget everyday life either. It presents problems and solutions to our daily concerns. This article explains the growing tragedy of runaways. Here's one on the ideal family. Is there such a thing? Can it even be achieved in a world of divorce, remarriage and step families? And there's more every month. Features on the environment and how to help young people deal with the pressures of teenage life. So why not request your free subscription now and begin to understand world events from a unique perspective. The Plain Truth magazine, as well as this booklet, How to Have a Happy Marriage, are yours free for the asking. Free of charge, no cost, and no obligation whatsoever. You'll never get a bill later. All you need to do is send your request to The World Tomorrow, Pasadena, California, 91123. That's all the address you need to receive the free literature offered on today's program. Once again, the address is The World Tomorrow, Pasadena, California, 91123. In Canada, write The World Tomorrow, Box 44, Station A, Vancouver, BC, V6C, 2M2. That's The World Tomorrow, Box 44, Station A, Vancouver, BC, V6C, 2M2. Now, before we close, here's a preview of what's coming up next week on The World Tomorrow. Everywhere we look today, we're bombarded with news of corruption, scandal, and greed. Ethics and morals continue to be a topic of much debate. But in a world of ever-changing values, who decides what is ethical? What are the standards by which we can determine true values? Don't miss next week's insightful program, Ethics, Who Decides? We hope to see you again next time. Thank you for joining us today. I'm David Hume for The World Tomorrow. Church of God.